So let's talk about drivers. Um, I remember in the original discussion, you mentioned that back in 2010, Sonus Faber might have used a new driver that you might have designed, but this was before um, the current generation where virtually all the drivers are designed by, by you in-house. Um, mm -hmm. The original design of the SE7, uh, of, of the Felice, uh, do you recall which of the drivers were your design, if any at all? Well, uh... Basically, uh, it was a crossing point and a defining moment as well in our history because each of the Phoenician drivers somehow had something coming from our own ideas, but they were not totally designed by us. But that said, um, all the diaphragms were uh, designed by us. And the diaphragms uh, were uh, the first step uh, into concepts which we kept developing over the following years. For instance, both the subwoofer and particularly the front firing woofers were using uh, um, sandwich cones. The subwoofer was using and still use, uses a, a thick, huge carbon fiber based sandwich cone. While the front firing woofers for the very first time, and this is a concept we kept evolving, over time was using a paper sandwich cone in order to, you know, to have a, a cone which is uh, stiff and lightweight. And this is something you can achieve with simple paper, but at the same time, it has a, a, a sonic texture, which is uh, in perfect harmony with the mid-range one because coherence means a lot to us. Of course, those drivers were based on, uh, back then on uh, existing drivers motor systems we just made some tricks here and there but the some of the elements were already existing were just heavily modified drivers on the other hand the midrange were designed from scratch even there and it was one of the very first time that we took the commitment to design from scratch uh, a loudspeaker after uh, uh, this is also marks a difference because um, when we made the SC17, uh, after seven years, uh, the original Dissonus Faber started a process which produced a lot of beautiful fruits, including an amazing mid range, which came after this Sonus Faber and which has been included in the Sonus Faber SC and which is currently our best mid range. So, so in the current SC17, all the drivers are designed in house. No, not exactly, because the woofers and the subwoofer are still the same one of the original Dissonance Father. So they, they have, as I mentioned, diaphragms and uh, some other details, such as the moving coil of the subwoofers and other details, which have been designed by us. But um, it's not a complete Sonus Faber new design. It's just an heavy tweak of an existing design, so to say. While the, uh, the mid-range, of the original Sonus Fiber was already a 100% a Sonus Fiber design. Like it is the new one, like it is the new Twitter, of course, right now, and uh, like are the rear firing elements as well. Let's talk about the Twitter, which is quite unique in your current lineup. Um, the vast majority of Sonus Fiber speakers today use a soft on Twitter that uh, you uh, developed and designed in-house and using the Dante Back Dome uh, technology. But for the SE17, you use a completely different uh, tweeter. Can you talk about this tweeter and why you chose to use this tweeter? Uh, this tweeter was developed by us in 2012-2013 uh, for a specific model, a crazy specific model that we made to celebrate our 30th anniversary. And this model would be extrema, the crazy speakers which we realized in only in 30 pairs. And the, that, that speakers, unlike any other Sonos Faber, had a very precise design goal. Absolute neutrality of the, of the sound presentation. And um, we did that because we took the challenge to 
to do something completely different to because sometimes um, to keep believing in your approach you have to challenge your approach you have to put everything under the discussion so that you can uh, evolve and you can uh, keep improving and this is what we did with the extrema in 2030 so what we did in order to achieve this absolute neutrality target we use a completely different approach when it comes to the high frequency reproduction um, and uh, instead of adding uh, precision, adding uh, extension, adding details to a generally soft and nice and warm sounding diaphragms, which is what we do with our DAD technology. We did exactly the opposite. We put in place a chemical process which allowed us to make a slightly more uh, neutral uh, and slightly more delicate, uh, a diaphragm which is typically sounding aggressive, which is a, an hard beryllium diaphragm. And um, this is interesting because it allows me to introduce also a philosophical concept. We, we like a lot philosophy when we think about our design here. Uh, once you want to reach uh, the, the pinnacle of music reproduction, it's like climbing a mountain. Right, and uh, you can start climbing the mountain from many different places, from north, from south, from east, from west. And uh, so your path in the very beginning might be extremely different. The more you approach the peak, the closer the path became, the closer the result became, but you started from different directions. It's the same for the tweeters. And uh, for one time, it's like, okay, our goal is uh, uh, extreme quality music reproduction. We always started the path from uh, the silk soft dome diaphragm path. For one time, let's do the exercise to start from an opposite direction, from a different direction, approaching the peak from another place. And uh, we did the beryllium exercise. Beryllium has uh, amazing performance when it comes to microdynamic. Uh, you already pointed out uh, in your uh, listening notes and your uh, and the conversation we had about uh, the performance of the Sonosub SC17. But beryllium, unfortunately, at least to our ears and to our taste, has uh, this sort of metallic and natural flavor in its uh, performance. And this is due to the fact that uh, uh, the average weight of uh, 29 millimeters diaphragm have normally a resonance peak slightly above 20 kilohertz. If you look at the frequency response above 20K, normally you see a peak. And this is the responsible because even if in theory, we shouldn't hear that frequencies, the way our perception works is slightly more complex. Once uh, frequencies above 20 K are associated with lower frequencies, we perceive the difference of what's happening above 20 K. I'm putting it in very simple words and to, to make the long story short. So basically we knew that to make, to keep all the good properties of a beryllium diaphragm, but to make it sound more natural, we needed to address that peak. And we did it through a very complicated, uh, expensive uh, chemical process, which is uh, a process which is capable to change the mechanical properties of the diaphragm almost without affecting the weight of the diaphragm itself. And this, chemi this chemical process is uh, a deposition of uh, diamond carbons on the top of a beryllium surface. Thanks to this chemical process, we are capable to change the mechanical properties of the diaphragm in such a way that we move up 10K higher that resonance peak, which generally results move from 25 kilohertz up to 35 kilohertz, which makes a huge difference to our perception. And uh, this is uh, our DLC beryllium based tweet. This is uh, the process we went through. Of course, uh, 
it is a very complicated process. It is a process that uh, it is also a little bit risky because you know that beryllium uh, is not exactly a safe material, particularly if you handle heat in a chemical way. So you have to pay a lot of attention and it is extremely expensive. But the result is that you have uh, this amazing music presentation in terms of micro dynamic. To me, this is what astonishing me the most. But uh, the aggressive behavior, the behavior of uh, such a transducer results mitigated after this process. So from 2013, we had in our portfolio this, uh, this Twitter, and we decided, well, if you are making uh, an update of the Sonus Faber SE, well, that's the Twitter we got to use. To, to the best of your knowledge, was this the first time that uh, a Twitter design like yours was introduced to the market where you have a carbon deposited uh, layer on top of beryllium? Is diamond carbons deposit on the on the on the beryllium? Uh, as far as I know, it's with our speaker, the Extrema, in 2013. Okay. So what about the mid-range? You mentioned earlier that the mid-range was your in-house design. Um, uh, and I believe that the first time you used this mid-range was in the Felice, is that correct? No, uh, I mean, uh, the, the original Fenice has oh, a different mid-range. So, so, some of the concepts, some of the concepts uh, available in today's so Sonus Faber C mid-range, which is, the AIDA Mark II midrange, it is the same midrange. The, the midrange is shared between the AIDA Mark II and the Sonus Faber SE. Some of the concepts were born with uh, the original the Sonus Faber or Fenicia. Uh, particularly the concept of having uh, a crazy construction when it comes to the basket. We made a basket out of CNC machine elements coming from two different metals. Uh, Avionol aluminum, which is aeronautic grade aluminum, and gum metal, which is uh, a particular kind of brass. Because those two elements combined together, they have uh, the tendencies to erase each other <coughs> in their own mood, in their own uh, resonance frequency. So we ended up having uh, an extremely silent case also for the midrange, for the midrange diaphragm, which is in our tradition, the most important diaphragm, the most important driver. And uh, so the concept of silence was not only affecting the cabin, the overall cabin construction, but even the basket of the midrange itself. And uh, the same concept was used on the AIDA, on the, the AIDA Mark II, and on the Dissonus Faber C17. And uh, the diaphragm is a different story because, uh, of course, uh, we believe that. Uh, uh, a natural sound is only achievable by using natural materials, particularly when it comes to the reproduction of the human voice, which is and always been the most valued property of any loudspeaker design here in Sonos Faber. So we kept evolving and playing with the blend of cellulose pulp and other natural elements combined with the cellulose pulp, including the drying process. It's a very long path, which I can describe for hours and the, the many different steps. But uh, uh, the point, the highest point we reach today is uh, that diaphragm, which is available in the AIDA in the Sonos Father. Well, let's talk about the, the part of the frequency range that astonished me the most, which is the bass and the very low bass of the SE17. So on the SE17, you have two front-facing woofers and one very, very large side-facing woofer. Um, yeah. Um, what made you decide that... So let me back up a little bit. Um, oftentimes, you will see designers who will put side-facing woofers but they might have one on either side of the enclosure to um, minimize or to um, cancel enclosure vibrations due to the big woofers. If they're placed on each side, the, the opposite vibrations will cancel the vibrations that are 
within the cabinet. Did you think about a design like that at all? Um, what made you decide to have the woofer uh, on the side firing as opposed to what you did with the AIDA, which is down firing? <clears throat> well, first of all, it was a, a fun factor thing. I have to be honest, it's already a very huge speaker. And uh, to have uh, the best possible performance on the bass, you needed to go with a 15 inch. But uh, it's not easy to place a 15 inch uh, around. So honestly speaking, we placed it where we could. And uh, we ended up placing it on, on a side, also knowing that uh, this gives you the advantage of uh, tuning a little bit the performance of the, of the lowest bass in your listening environment by simply deciding if placing the subwoofer firing inside or outside. And uh, we took the benefit of this configuration because placing underneath, there was no room. Placing in the front, there was no room. And nevertheless, we wanted the base, which only a 15 inch is capable to provide for our best design. Well, um, did you consider at all having uh, woofers on either side of the enclosure um, firing simultaneously, but in essence, opposite to each other? Of course, uh, we considered. Of course, we considered. But, uh, you know, a 15 inch in, to perform properly needs the proper loading volume. Two 15 inch to perform properly needs to ice that volume. Okay. And we did not add all that volume available <laughs> because we wanted our 15 inch, of course, to 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 reach uh, 20 hertz flat. And so you need a lot of loading volume to do that. And uh, no matter how good the 15 inch design is. So we stick with this solution. Of course, we thought to put uh, two subwoofers one against each other. But uh, the price to be paid was to lower the size. And uh, at the end, the result was not that, uh, um, how can I say, interesting. I believe that the, the result uh, achieved by this sonus fiber in the reproduction of the lowest frequency is uh, really something. Yes, I agree. This is, a, this is a matter of size. This is a matter of size. Do you, do you think that you could have achieved a similar result if you had used multiple 10 or 12 inch woofers instead of one 15 inch woofer? Mm, mm, not really, not really, not really because, you know, the, the performance on the base is not only due to the 15 inches, due with the combination with the 10 inch from firing. So. You have a diameter which is already wide enough to, uh, to give you all, all the punch, all the impact directly. It's a smash on, your, on the listener face. But then you need to complete it with uh, you know, the ability to move a lot of air. Going 12 inch wouldn't be the same. Uh, let's talk about the the, the enclosure that you call the sound field shape. So on the back of the speaker, there's an actual enclosure with drivers mounted in the enclosure and a dial that allows you to adjust the angle of the enclosure. You call that the sound field shape. What was the inspiration behind this enclosure? What were you trying to achieve with this enclosure and its ability to be adjusted? Oh, wow. Well, mm, it was, let's put it this way. Uh, Sonos Faber, uh, back in the days, and this, is, this was more true back in the days, was always looking at the, the music instruments, particularly the acoustic music instruments as a source of inspiration. And, uh, you know, particularly if you, play a piano inside of a, a room, inside of a space, um, you, you really can't tell, even if uh, it, actually you can, 
but you really can tell if the sound is going one direction or another. The sound is going more or less everywhere, no matter the note you play. And we wanted to reach uh, this sort of effect. At the same time, from the electroacoustic perspective, we were uh, spending a lot of time thinking about uh, the difference between the pressure frequency response and the power frequency response. The pressure frequency response is the frequency response we are all used to consider. It's the, you put a, the microphone at the right uh, in the sweet spot in front of the baffle and you measure the contribution of uh, every single driver merged together thanks to the crossover network. The power frequency response, it is uh, actually, and it is connected to that thinking process I was mentioning a few moments ago, it's about taking several frequency response all around the speakers, top to bottom, and making the average of all those frequency response. If you do that on a conventional speakers, obviously you end up having a, a, a dropping frequency response because of the uh, space behavior of the frequencies as long as you move higher, right? So that device, the sound fish shaper technology from the electroacoustic standpoint was meant to being a, a, an, an energy compensation for that. It was meant to fill the energy of the mid-high frequencies in the space, trying to achieve a more linear power frequency response. This was the thinking behind. The practical effect, as soon as we started making experiments with the this idea was that you ended up somehow having the chance to manage the depth of the sound stage. And we also realized that having the ability to aim this emission was giving you flexibility in this management. So the result was a system which is capable to uh, introduce further mean high frequency acoustic energy into your listening environment uh, at different emission levels, but also that can uh, be aimed somehow in uh, different directions. And uh, we found it a beautiful tool, even if it is quite complicated to be correctly implemented. And uh, we decided to provide this uh, further interesting tool to be some Faber customers. And uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's the thinking process. And that's uh, another element which uh, basically allows the, um, the customer to literally shape the, the sound stage produced by such a loudspeaker system. We always advise to start with the, that system uh, switch it off because you have the chance to switch off the system and to set up the speakers like they were conventional speakers and to find the best positioning possible in your listening environment and already achieving uh, an excellent result. Once you do that, that's the time to start playing with uh, the system and to add some further depth, some further ambience some further feeling of space, which can be very different in results of the many different listening environments you end up placing uh, such a loudspeaker system. So, so Mike, I noticed that with my experience with um, the sound shaper module, uh, the end result was you could get a significantly broader sound stage as well as uh, a sensation of an illusion of, of greater depth. Um, that uh, wasn't as obvious when I turned it off. So that was a very nice uh, sense of additional illusion, if you will, especially if you don't have a choice and your speakers have to be relatively close to the wall in front of it. Uh, by, by careful adjustment, you could add um, this detachment of the image from the speaker. You, you could get a much better sense of uh, detachment. It was a, quite wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm glad you like it. It's a very nice oh, tool in our opinion. I love it. Um, you mentioned earlier that as a result of all these new drivers, the SE17 had to uh, naturally have all new crossovers. 
And I assume that um, with that, you started to also implement some of the more exotic boutique crossover parts that perhaps were not available back in 2010. Um, do you find that these kinds of boutique um, exotic parts make a substantial improvement or that they do make a difference and you have to use it in your top model so simply because you're pursuing the final or as much as possible the, the, the results that you're looking for, regardless of cost? Well, you know, everything makes a difference when you reach such a level. And um, I'm not sure of having understand correctly your your question. Of course, uh, in uh, in Dissonus Favre and Dissonus Favre C17, uh, when it comes to crossover components, we use the best of the best. And uh, but we don't use things which are unnecessary. We use things only if they provide a tangible listening result. And um, this is the ratio. Sorry, leading us in choosing uh, uh, the quality of the components. Of course, uh, we are using uh, some of the best capacitors available in our crossover network. And believe me, the difference they make when it comes to the reproduction of the realism of the high frequency, the amount of details is unbelievable. And so this is the, the thinking behind which leads us in uh, selecting uh, the components of the crossover network, absolutely. Yeah, that, that was what I was asking very poorly, unfortunately. And that was, um, oh, I've never had the opportunity to compare crossover parts. And yet, uh, certainly, um, I've heard from people who do it themselves. And some people say they haven't heard much of a difference when they go from a good, well-made capacitor to a, a, an exotic brand like a Mundo. And other people, on the other hand, you say you're deaf. It's, 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 the difference is night and day. Going to a, a Mondor versus a Philips capacitor, no comparison whatsoever. So I was just curious what, what your thoughts were in having done that. I mean, my, my, my thoughts are based on the experience. To me, they, sometimes it's night and day difference. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the... You know, there's a rational part in me which uh, still struggles to admit this, but uh, I trust my perception and my perception, and not only my perception, because we, we double check it several times with other people. Listen to this, listen to that. I mean, that, that there's a, a pretty much different, only even one compositor in a very simple crossover design in series of the Twitter can change the perceived quality of the overall system a lot. Um, is there anything that I might have missed in the discussion of the SE17 that you might want to uh, highlight uh, in this discussion? Mm, I have to say that really not, really mm -hmm. not. I think that we, we really we really covered every single detail of um, of the SE17. I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd when it comes to wanting to know <laughs> more about something, especially when. I find something so intriguing and wonderful. Um, you are absolutely welcome. Is there any anything that you can share with us with regards to future products that you're working on that doesn't give anything away? Mm. No. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. And then the last question yeah. for you. you you've, been, you've been so kind with your time. Um, I had asked you earlier to prepare a list of five recordings that you love, um, both for its sonic quality as well as its musical quality that you can share with our viewers so that they can go on Tidal or they can go and find the recordings and listen for themselves to see what it is that you like about these recordings. Five recordings that have great sound and great musicality. Okay. Mm -hmm. I I would pick things uh, which are not necessarily 100% audiophile, but there are some elements which are uh, extremely interesting from the musical standpoint and from the performance standpoint as well. First that comes to my mind is uh, Lady in Satin by Billie Holiday. It's probably her, her last recorded uh, piece of music. Uh, she's singing 
with an orchestra, there's a piece which is sometimes moves me to, to tears these days, which is I'm a fool to want you. And uh, of course, the overall recording is not particularly interesting, but her voice is captured pretty well in such a way that with a good system, you can really feel that uh, she was really in bad shape. Mm, singing was uh, not easy for her at this stage, and uh, it is uh, it is moving. It is moving because you can you can feel that her breathing is not. Uh, how can I say? It's not uh, it's not perfect. Uh, another recording that uh, I would pick. It is uh, Dance Macabre by Saint Simon on the record, uh, which is brew. It is uh, one of the several uh, super classic of um, the um, late 50s, uh, if I am correct. And uh, it is unbelievable that uh, such a quality recording of a big symphonic orchestra was performed uh, 70 years ago. And the, the level of detail is... Is this the one with Mercury or uh, with, with London? It should be living stereo. It should be living stereo. Yeah, it's, it's living stereo, which is blue. And uh, Dance Macabre or Dance Macabre, I don't even know how to pronounce it exactly, by San Simon. And uh, it is uh, seven and a half minute uh, pieces of music which is uh, dynamically and um, unbelievable and it is the unbelievable also from uh, the tonal standpoint there are a lot of instruments to be checked in strings brass playing all at once uh, the dynamic from the macro dynamic is amazing third record that i will pick it is uh, a record from the, the 90s, a record that I love, which is the third the Massive Attack album, Mezzanine. And uh, particularly uh, the first track, Angel. And uh, the bass performance over there is amazing. It challenges almost every system. And uh, it's a pleasure to be heard with the Sonos Faber as he's so agile as soon as we I'm going to be playing it. <laughs> I, su I, suggest, I suggest you to, to go and double check in. Yeah. And uh, what else? Um, two more. Two more you need. Well, uh, surely. Wow. Another. Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious, but another piece of music, again, coming from the 90s, which is where uh, things were happening when I was uh, young. Uh, and uh, I have the most deepest connection is surely uh, the only record that uh, Jeff Buckley gave us, which is, uh, um, of course, uh, Grace. And I'm talking about the Leonas Cohen cover, Hallelujah, that he played in this reverberant situation, only using this Telecaster and his amazing voice. This is, uh, again, something which is uh, always telling me that the system is going in the right direction. It's a test, even if it's not an audio file thing, even if sometimes the C-bilans are uh, unavoidable to be reproduced in a bad way, but the overall feeling uh, always telling me a lot of things. Another record that I use a lot when it comes to setting up speakers Everybody uses it, everybody knows it, but it is uh, The Girl in the Other Room by Diana Crow. Even if the, the voice is recorded a little bit too big, I know so well that record and that track's almost blue particularly, but also The, the Girl in the Other Room, the, the, the track, I mean. This is my test track when it comes to setting up speakers in a room because to achieve the right proportion between all the things happening. So I miss uh, only one. And uh, well, I would say that um, there are so many. That's why I'm fighting. But uh, I'm going to tell you another, which is similar to somehow to Jeff Buckley, and it is about an artist few people know, 
um, um, which is not that famous, which is John Martin. And uh, the record, it is one word. And this guy was used to be uh, a dear friend of um, Jesus Christ. But let's let's I, I will uh, it will come to my mind. Uh, sorry, it was a dear friend of Nick Drake, uh, the guy who made Pink Moon and uh, and on. And it is uh, a guy playing a lot with his voice and making a lot of different strange sounds. And uh, he was among the first guy to sort of uh, creating loops back in the early 70s with his guitar. And uh, I highly recommend this record, One Word by John Martin, but generally speaking, all his production, so including one uh, one John, Martin, John Martin, M, yeah, M A R T uh, Y N. T Y N, okay, yes. Oh, there it is. And yeah. also, yeah, and also Solid Air by him, which is a, a beautiful record and the song he wrote in memory of his friend, Nick Drake, who passed away so quickly. There's a lot of emotion. There are amazing musical skills. And there's also the ability to being uh, ahead of uh, anybody else because uh, he was already looping his guitar playing and playing on top of himself. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned um, Jeff Buckley because I was listening to Jeff Buckley last night. Uh, on the SE17, um, and uh, uh, you're right, it, it, it has this very magical quality, realizing that he was with us for a very short period of time, and for me, his, uh, his singing of uh, Hallelujah is, is the definitive uh, version. I, I like his event, yeah. yeah. Well, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you answered everything that I could think of, and, and I want to thank you so much for spending the time. Uh, it's so good to catch up with you. It's, it's been too long, two years. And, and yeah. I look forward to uh, the next time that we can travel again and see each other, possibly at a show, or if not, they'll give me an excuse to come out to Italy again and enjoy the wonderful food and the, the wonderful culture and, and, and the weather. It's, it's miserable here today. Well, you have to come here. You're absolutely welcome, absolutely, as soon as it is possible. But also, yeah, one way or another, we will catch up and uh, we will meet again and talk in person like we all deserve. Yeah. In the wild time, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for having me here. And uh, keep enjoying the SC17. Oh, you, you, you can believe I will do so. And please give my regards to everybody there. Say hi to everybody. I will. And uh, we will see each other soon, I'm sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Paolo, appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody, bye-bye.